Good morning. Good morning. I think we can do that one a little better. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. There we go. This is like a little delay the first time. Hey, I'm, I'm, it's so good to be with you all. I'm especially excited to be with you today because this is actually the first time that I get to be with you all and preach as one of your pastors. So that's really exciting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited about that, but I will be honest, when I saw the text that I was going to be preaching from this morning, I was a little bit less excited. Um, honestly, I think that Numbers is very possibly the worst title for a book ever. That's just, that's bad. You know, I mean, there may be some, some math teachers or accountants that, agree, that disagree with me in here, but... Nothing screams a less compelling story to me than the idea of math and numbers. And I think that when we uh, translated this book from title from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, we kind of missed out because the, the original Hebrew title for this book was actually Bamidmar, which means not, not numbers, it means in the wilderness. How much, how much more engaging, how much more uh, fitting of a title is that in the wilderness? Because that's exactly where the story is. And way back in the first week of our journey, of trusting the journey, uh, Marnie defined what in the wilderness means. And um, the way she defined it was so poignant. It really stuck with me. She, she said, the wilderness is needs, but no resources, dreams, but no direction, and fears, and we don't know who to trust. Wow. Needs, but no resources, dreams, but no direction, and fears, but we don't know who to trust. And that, that's the emotional state of being in the wilderness. That's exactly where the Israelites are as we step into their story. And in a second, as, as I pray, I dare you to prepare yourself for this story by getting into that same space, by, by stepping into the wilderness, into where the Israelites are. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we open your word, I pray that it would do what it does, Lord, that, that it would be alive, that it would be active, that it would confront us, that it would correct us, that it would encourage us, that it would challenge us, and that it would transform us. Lord, I pray that you would uh, open our, our minds to hear, our hearts, as well as our feet to action. God, I, uh, I thank you so much that you are good and you don't hide your word and your ways from us, but that, God, you, you tell them to us. You've written page after page after page of who you are and your plan for us to find. Lord, show us this morning. God, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So no surprise, we're in the book of Numbers. We're going to start with verse one, and it says, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So as at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. There's gonna be a map that pops up. Really soak in this map. We're gonna come back to this a lot today. But uh, as you can kind of see, the Israelites have been traveling for a while. They've made their way out of Egypt, and then they've journeyed all the way around the Sinai Peninsula, and they find themselves at the beginning of this story camped out in the wilderness of Paran. And this would have taken a couple years to get them to this space. And they are both physically in the space that they're at and emotionally camped in the wilderness. And in that space, that second line of what we just read would have been tremendously important. 
the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. This promised land that he is giving, this, this is the promise that has brought them together as a nation. This is the promise that's held them together for centuries in slavery in Egypt. The promise that that God has a place for them. God has a home for them, a purpose, an identity. God has a plan for them that's so much more, even though for generations it seemed like anything but that. They spent generation after generation as second-class citizens, generations as slaves in Egypt, generations with, with little to no power and little wealth, and generations with seemingly no hope for anything more than that, except for God, except for this promise, for the covenant that God had with Abraham that he did have more for them. He had a plan for them. He had a purpose for them. He had a hope for them. He had a home. And that's kept them together for centuries. And now as we start this story in the wilderness of Paran, they're right on the cusp of that promise being fulfilled. They 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 can see it almost. They're just weeks or months away from being able to, to get into the promised land to get to set down some roots, to have a home. I bet that they could almost taste the milk and honey of the promised land. You know, so much so that Moses, when he sends out the spies, he tells them to bring back some of that fruitfulness of the land, I think, so that the Israelites could literally taste the milk and honey. You know, they're so close to all of these promises being fulfilled. And so God sends this team of scouts to check it out before they go and take that land. And we don't know from the text exactly what God's intentions were in sending out this scout team. But when Moses sends them out and he gives them their directions, we get a little bit more information about at least what Moses was thinking the plan was. Moses' idea of why they were sending this team out. And we see, uh, starting in verse 17, it reads, When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? And, and do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land because it was the season for the first ripe grapes. Now, there's probably two main intentions and aims that Moses has when he sends out those spies and gives them those directions. He wants to gain some tactical info. He wants to know, okay, what's going on with these people that are in this land? What's going on with their cities? What are their defenses like? How strong are they? What's going on there? And then he also wants them to uh, get evidence of God's fulfillment of these promises, to bring back fruit, to go by these different spaces so that they can strengthen the faith of the Israelites in the wilderness, because we know that they're already struggling. Uh, Chapter 11 and 12, right before this, we see that the Israelites are grumbling. And one thing that's interesting, we're going to see another map. Yeah, that blue arrow up there, that's going from where they're camped out in the wilderness straight into the promised land. So this is the route that Moses sent those spies on. And you can see from it, there's major bodies of water on either side. There's the Mediterranean Sea, and then there's that big inland sea to the right And Moses intentionally, tactically sends them on this because all those major cities would have been based around the water. So the spies are able to gather intel on all of them, but not get so close that they're in conflict with them. It also allows them to go through Hebron, which would have been an incredibly meaningful space for the Israelites because that's where Abraham was buried. And it's where God first showed Abraham this land 
that is promised to his descendants, this covenanted land. So Moses, you know, he has this very tactical aim, and this is his plan of what it looks like. And part of where he does this route is because this is probably the route that in his mind, in just a couple months, this is the route that they're going to take when they take over the promised land, when they go in to attack and conquer the promised land. So this is kind of a test run. And so he sends them this way. And then next we hear the report back from the spies, starting in verse 25. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. And so here we have the first part of their report. The land is just as good as we'd been promised. You know, maybe even better. It it does flow with milk and honey. You know, these things that we've been dreaming of, our our wildest imaginations, they're true. And they, they brought back all sorts of fruits. I don't know if you guys caught it when Moses sent them out, but he wasn't very committal about that part. He was like, hey, if you can, do your best to bring back some of the fruit. And they brought back all sorts of fruit. This, this land was, was teeming with fruit. They got pomegranates and figs, and they bought grapes. Man, did they bring back some grapes. <laughs> they brought back grapes that were so big that two men had to carry them between them on a pole. Massive, incredible grapes. In fact, the area where they collected these grapes, they actually named Eshkol which means cluster, because that cluster of grapes that they collected there was so spectacular. And if you guys know me, you know that I'm a big fan of food. So this part really spoke to me. But I also was pretty skeptical. I was like, I've never seen or heard of grapes of that magnitude or size. And so I had to do a little bit of research into that. And it turns out that area where they found those grapes around Hebron is still an area where they grow a lot of grapes. It's known for its grapes. And they actually have an annual Hebron grape festival. And this is, this is a picture from just a couple years ago at that grape festival. And if you notice, it's kind of hard to see, but the bottom left of the picture, that's a person. <laughs> that's a human head. This cluster of grapes is, is my size. This is, this is a magnificent grape. <laughs> this is incredible. You know, like I've, this is, beyond my wildest dreams that these grapes existed. And I have the internet. I can't imagine what these spies saw and felt and experienced when they brought back, you know, grapes that two people had to carry on a pole between them. It's incredible. The land was incredibly fruitful. Anything that they could have imagined or dreamed of. And yet when they give that first part of their report back, I don't know if you noticed it, but they don't seem very excited. They, they should be floored, but they're not. Did you catch what they called the promised land? What they called this, this land of the covenant, this land teeming with milk and honey that they have been waiting centuries for? They called it that land that you sent us to. That, okay, Moses, that place you made us go. They immediately are distancing themselves from the promise of God and the covenant of God. They're already rejecting God and his plan and his purposes. And after they state this incredible news and show this incredible bounty that they've brought back, they get to what they think is their main point, the important part of their report for them. And that's these scary dangers and these giants that are ahead. Starting in verse 28. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. 
And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. So it's definitely true that the scouts, they saw scary people. They saw large people. They saw warriors. You know, these these Anakim that they talk about, they're scary dudes. But they also then exaggerate them like crazy. That they thought we looked like grasshoppers to them. They They are descendants of angels. That's what the Nephilim are. They're saying, hey, they are these non-human, legendary warrior kings that you've only heard about. That's how scary these people are. But don't miss that they are scary. They are terrifying. They are big. Um, We have historical accounts from other civilizations at the time that these, these Anakim were scary. The Egyptians feared them, uh, tried to stay away from them. We see them mentioned actually four times in the Egyptian uh, execration texts, is what they're called, which are really a very interesting form of historical text because they're, um, it's pottery. And it's usually found on broken pottery, and you'll understand why in a second. And the Egyptians, they would make a, like a clay figure or they would make a clay pot And they'd write the names of their feared enemies on them, names of their their leaders and and names of different people groups that they were afraid of and they wanted to conquer. And they'd bake them, they'd fire them up, and they'd smash them like little Egyptian voodoo dolls. So we have these different references of the Egyptians making voodoo dolls of the Anakim. And you don't make voodoo dolls of somebody that you want to just go challenge and think that you can beat on your own. And these are the Egyptians. This is the nation that Israel just, was just enslaved by. A nation that's been around a very long time, that has a strong military. And they were scared of these Anakim. Not only that, they saw scary people, but they also saw cities like Jericho and Ai that had all these big walls. They were heavily fortified and they were well established. They'd been around a long time. They had their systems set up. Remember, in contrast, the Israelites, they don't have any roots. They don't have any fortified cities. They don't even have walls. They're a nomadic nation that's looking at fighting against all these traditional established military powers. It would have been intimidating. It would have been overwhelming. Just looking at the cities, it would have been intimidating and overwhelming, let alone when they see the people in them could beat them up also. (laughs) It's scary. And these spies had no desire to be part of those conflicts, to be part of those battles, to be part of those wars. So much so that they say that they're ready to turn around and go back into slavery. Or even that they're ready, they'd rather just die in the desert. The spies see what lies ahead of them. They take this report, they see the good, they see the scary, and they respond with fear and with doubt. And both of those reactions, they're understandable. I mean, the Israelites were just two years ago, slaves in Egypt. They're not warrior people. They're not any sort of established nation. And, and from a human perspective, from the human lens, it all makes total sense. We understand that. Because they saw an unwinnable fight. They saw hopeless suffering. Ultimately, they saw failure. They saw probably the annihilation of the nation of Israel. This, this fragile thing in their minds that they had been protecting for centuries. To the human perspective, it totally makes sense. But God, God doesn't look at the world. He's not limited to our human perspective. 
His view, his plans, his ways, they're, they're so much higher, they're so much better. And the, the nation of Israel, these spies that have been sent, time and time again, they'd been shown that. They'd been shown that God had a plan, that he had a purpose, that he had a hope for them that was more than they could imagine. That when God says that he's gonna do it, he's gonna do it. He's gonna make a way. So often we fall into that same trap. But the Israelites here, they're only a couple years removed from the miraculous happenings of the Exodus, of being liberated from Egypt, of being uh, swept through the sea, of a pillar of fire. They've seen so many things already that were so much bigger than that, what they dreamed. As we go through the story of the Exodus, no part of it would have been like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the plan. No, they kept seeing God go, I'm gonna do something new. I'm gonna do something that you never thought about. And yet, they respond in doubt and fear. And their lack of faith is a clear rejection of God. It's a clear rejection of the covenant and the promises that they've made with him and that he's made with them. I think it's fascinating that when the spies return and give their report, we don't see any argument about the report itself. About, about what's in it, about the truth there, which there certainly could have been argument about it because they're saying, hey, these people that are in this land, they're mythical angel beings. Like, you could have definitely said like, well, maybe you got any proof on that? There's, they take this incredibly good report and they take these scary things exactly as they're presented, but the responses are different. The vast majority there responds out of fear and responds out of doubt. Out of the 12 spies, we only see two of them respond in faith. Caleb and Joshua are the only ones that take that report and respond in faith. And it's easy for us to look at the Israelites and be like, man, how could they do that? They've seen so much. They've been part of so much of what God had for them. They've seen miracles. But throughout history, we continue to do the same thing. We continue to forget. We continue to respond out of doubt, out of fear. The Apostle Paul calls out the church in in Corinth in 1 Corinthians because they'd forgotten this lesson. Referring to the Israelites in this story, he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. It's a powerful reminder then, powerful reminder now, because any point in history we can look at and see that we let fear, we let doubt, we let scary things, we let anxiety lead us to not respond in faith. Just this week, I was listening to... um, a modern theologian and and British biblical scholar called N.T. Wright. And this week, he he felt the need also to talk about this story in Numbers and about how often we tend to respond out of fear instead of out of faith. And I, I thought about trying to read the quote out, but I think it's better in his British accent, so I'll just let him say it. I think of this frequently when I think of the way in which we get scared or anxious about the things which we think maybe God is calling us to do and maybe it'll be difficult to do this or dangerous to do that or scary to attempt the other. And again and again, the word we need to hear is the word which says, actually, not only can I enable you to do this because this is what I've called you to do and equipped you to do, despite what you may may imagine, but there are much greater things out beyond. And if you follow me and if you're faithful to me at this moment in this way, then much greater blessings than you can imagine will follow from that. Throughout history, time and time again, God has bigger plans than we can imagine from our human perspective. But on top of that, he gives us so many chances to respond in faith, to be part of what he's doing. As a church, we've, we've been in a wilderness period. 
We've experienced that emotional state of wilderness. Some of us are experiencing that state. As individuals, we've all experienced that. We've all ex- seen, have, and will have scary, insurmountable seeming giants. And we need Caleb's and Joshua's. We need those who are going to respond with faith in the face of those scary things, in the face of those giants. Very soon, really soon, we're going to be moving into our new campus on Hecktown. And it's not going to be a rosy place because it's not our plans, it's God's plans that that campus is for. And God's plans are big, they're scary, and they're so much more than ours. And so there's going to be giants there. There's going to be incredibly scary, insurmountable things that we face there as we try to do what God has for us. We're going to need people who respond with faith instead of doubt and fear. We need that. But notice, I said we will need, not God will need. Because God's going to fulfill his promises with or without us. God is good and he is going to do what he has promised and what he has coveted, whether we're on board or not. But he so wants for us to be along for the ride. He desperately wants us to be a part of it. Because he knows that it's what's best overall for this world, for creation, but it's also what's best for us. So he gives us so many chances to be part of his incredible plans. Even when his ways are so much higher than we can understand. In our passage today, even as the Israelites reject God and push him away, push his plan and his promises away, God remains faithful to them. He honors his, he honors his promises. He does what he said he was going to do. But then he also honors their choices. He allows them to live in disobedience, to live in rebellion, to live in doubt and fear. And he gives them what they ask for. They ask, don't make us go into that land. Let us die here in the desert. And so they do. Only a faithful few out of that generation get to make it to the promised land. Get to see the incredible things and fulfillment that God had for them. The rest get to die in the desert like they asked. Got one more map for us. You'll, rec- you'll remember that blue line. That's, that's the path that Moses had planned and that he sent those spies on and the plan that he thought for how they were going to take the promised land. And those red arrows, that's the way God took them out there. God didn't say, hey, you know, what's the most tactical place? What's the way that makes sense? God saw those fortified cities like Jericho and he went, hey, we're going to go right up to Jericho. You guys are going to march around that wall for a few days. You guys are going to blow some trumpets and those walls are just going to fall down and that city is going to be yours because my ways are not like yours. And when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And God's plan didn't make any sense. Moses or any of the Israelites were never going to be like, oh yeah, you know, that's how we're going to take the promised land. But God knew that he was going to. God and his ways were so much bigger. And for those faithful few, for the ones that responded with faith, they got to be part of that. Can you imagine that? Just seeing those walls fall down, getting to be part of the incredible, miraculous things of God. It's so much better when we respond with faith and step into that terrifying, step into that scary stand face to face with those giants because then we get to be part of those incredible big miraculous things that God has for us God's going to let us choose but it's so much better to respond with faith and step into that would you pray with me Father God again I just thank you so much that you are good that you make good promises, that you have good plans. God, that you have decided that you want us to be part of them. Even though we don't deserve it, we didn't earn it, we um, don't have that much to offer, honestly, but God, you choose for us to be with you. 
you give us that chance. You moved heaven and earth so we can know you and we can follow you. Lord God, I pray that you'd help us to know what you have for us. Show us your ways, show us your plans. Lord, help us to see in your word, help us to see through prayer, help us to see through your community, just what you have in store for us, to see your promises, to see your ways. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see those giants, to see those terrifying, scary things, because that means that we have found your path. And God, help us to respond in faith. And Lord, do what you do and conquer those giants. God, you are so good. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.